Well, good morning, church family. Good morning. For those who don't know me, my name is Michael Berg. I'm a student at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and this semester I'm interning here at Northminster, so thank you for welcoming me in. A special well, well, a special welcome to all of you because it's Daylight Saving Sunday and you are here on time, so well done. Now, of course, you might have been here an hour early and I would know it, but anyway, thank you for being here this morning. A special welcome to you if you're worshiping with us online and if you're a first-time guest. We're so grateful that you're with us. Here at Northminster, we are a church that is passionate about becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. And how we think about that is by moving in, up, and out. So we move in by connecting with one another through friendships that minister the love of Christ. So just this past Wednesday, my wife and I attended the first Wednesday fellowship night. We had tasty fried chicken, cheesy potatoes, played games, just hung out with our church family. It was so much fun and it was an excellent way to move in and connect to one another. We move up by being transformed by God's word, by living and learning God's word. So in, in a little while, Pastor Bob will have a sermon for us, and that's the way that we learn God's word so that we can go and live it out. And finally, we move out by serving our neighbors with genuine agape care. Now, one way we move out is with our Thanksgiving food drive that is still underway. So out in the foyer, we have gratitude boxes that you can pick up on your way out. Now these are due next week, November 13th. So if you haven't yet, be sure to pick up a gratitude box. There's, a, there's instructions, a scripture card, and a cardboard box that you can fill. But next week, November 13th, is the last week to turn those in. This is a way that we move out to serve our neighbors. Now second, you have a connect card in your program this morning. We just ask that everyone here, whether a first-time guest or a long-time member, if you could fill out that Connect card. That helps us to know who's here, who's not here. It helps us to serve you, helps us to serve one another as we share the love of Christ. Well, one of the joys of my life is that I get to coach an eighth-grade boys basketball team. I love it, working with the eighth graders. They're a lot of fun. I love connecting with them. A lot of them aren't Christians, so it's a way for me to show the love of Christ to people who don't know him yet. And one of my goals for my team this year is I want them to have an attitude of gratitude. I want them to be grateful people, grateful that they get to play basketball, that they're healthy enough that they can play, that they get to go to school and learn every day, that they get to be on a team and learn what it means to work with one another. And so it got me thinking, what kind of attitude, what kind of attitude should we have as Christians? And it took me to a passage that Paul wrote in Philippians 2. So our call to worship this morning is a reading from Philippians 2, verses 1 through 11. These are Paul's words to the church in Philippians 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in their very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being in, found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to, to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So church, this morning, may we together worship our holy God by the power of the Holy Spirit as we proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God 
the Father. Let's stand and worship. Sing Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Sin was grace, and twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. And how precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, and I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine, will be forever mine. Let's sing, you are, you are forever Jesus, 
Cause you don't owe me anything More than anything that you can do I just want you You can be seated As we go into prayer this morning, we want to remember especially the Cologne family and the passing of David last week and the Stout family at the passing of George this weekend. Would you pray with me? Father, we enter into this moment with a complex set of experiences and feelings. We're aware of your uh, joyful presence with us. We're so grateful for who you are. We celebrate your truth. We're blessed to have you among us, to have you in us, to have known how you've revealed yourself in Christ. But we are also troubled and sad. Uh, we mourn the loss of friends and family. We lament the brokenness of the world that those losses represent. God, we thank you that we, the church, are uniquely suited to live in this complexity. We know the sorrow and the pain of the world, and we also know the glad hope that all things will be made right again. And so, God, I ask that you would give us, again this morning, confidence in your promises. Confidence in your promise to redeem those who belong to you. Confidence that you will return us back into relationship with you through the work of Christ. Confidence that you are restoring all of creation one day as you come to make all things right and establish new heavens and new earth. Lord, we confess that without your work to do these things, we would be lost. God, our hearts are often cold to your truth. We're often insistent on our own desires. We often ignore others and their needs too often. We're not guided by the new law of love. And for these things and more, we ask forgiveness. Lord, we proclaim that we have that forgiveness in the finished work of Christ on the cross. And so now we ask that your Holy Spirit empower and equip us to be your people in the world. We ask for the courage to be a light in a dark reality, that we would tell truth, that we would care for those in need, and we would put others before ourselves. We ask for the courage to be witnesses in the world, and so we ask that we might proclaim the truth of Jesus wherever we go in both our words and deeds. And we ask for the courage to live holy lives, that we would be obedient to the character you've called us to have, and that your spirit might grow fruit in our thoughts and actions and words. Lord, with heavy hearts, we pray especially this morning for the Cologne and Stout families. We celebrate the lives of David and George and how you use them to serve others consistently and faithfully. And we will miss them and we grieve their passing. We pray also for their families as they walk through this season of sadness and lament. May your presence comfort them. May your peace surround them. And may the hope that you give them be strength that they need at this time. God, we ask these things because of the love of God and in the power of the Spirit, and according to the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom 
in the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, at this moment, uh, if you're in third grade or under and you want to head out for a little bit of extra time, you're going to be with uh, Mr. Curry and Mr. Steyer. You're going to meet them right at the door there. They're going to go watch a video and play and hang out. So as they're heading out, we're going to stand and greet in one another. You may know that November 1st is the start of soup season. So share your favorite soup. Stand and greet someone and share your favorite soup. Same with you guys. Hi, my friend. How are you? I like Good. the soup from High Beats, like chicken rice and bacon, but you don't taste the bacon. And it tastes so good. You don't like bacon? No, I don't like bacon. I don't like bacon either. Let's sing, my hope is built on nothing less. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest ray, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Let's sing when darkness seems, when darkness seems to hide his face, and I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale. My anchor holds within. And Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. And through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. And He shall come. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless we stand before the throne, Christ alone, Christ alone. Cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. And through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Let's sing this chorus out one more time. We sing Christ alone. In Christ alone, cornerstone, weak strong in the Savior's love and through the storm he is 
A couple of weeks ago, when our son John was in town, we got online and we rented Top Gun Maverick. 36 years ago, the first Top Gun was released, and if you've seen either one of them, you know it's uh, stories about a character by the name of uh, Lieutenant Pete Mitchell, who goes by the call sign of Maverick. He's a Navy fighter pilot. And if you've watched either of those films or maybe something else from that genre, then you know what, uh, how a targeting system works in a jet plane. At least to the point where you know that it comes up on your screen and, and they're always paying attention to that screen. And once they can get that, that plane in front of them, and it lines up and all of a sudden it begins to beep and, and the, all the lines turn red. I'm sure that's all you need to know to fly a jet plane and to do a dogfight. But they use the term, I'm locked in. I'm locked in. What if our targeting system is not correctly calibrated? What if there's something wrong with our targeting system, and rather than being locked in on the right thing, it's zeroed in on something altogether different. You know, in life, when people are locked in on something that is self-destructive, maybe even destructive to the people around them, we will think about planning an intervention. If somebody has an addiction and there's a pattern in their life and, and we know it's causing them harm and harm to those around them, we'll, we'll set it up. And people talk about different kinds of interventions. They talk about a simple intervention where people just who know the person or the family, they gather together to have that important conversation. There's a classic intervention. That's where you do some uh, uh, preparation. There's some teaching that takes place. There's maybe a professional facilitator. There can be a family system intervention. That's where you would look at not just one individual, but maybe a pattern of, of interactions where there's codependency taking place. And, and you want to address all those things together because you know that it works as a system. And then they talk about a, a, a crisis intervention where somebody might be causing self-harm or putting someone else at special risk of harm. Today, we'll be exploring a fifth kind of intervention, a divine intervention. Now, so far in our series, we're in this series that we have been calling, Yes, We're Open, to hearing the Spirit speak, to hearing the Spirit of God speak to us, to, to hearing God revealed to us. And so far in our series, we have found a, a passage of that early church experience where where Jesus had died and he was raised from the dead and, and he was going to ascend to uh, be with the Father. Before he ascended, he spoke to the leaders of the early church, to his disciples. And after he ascended, we found these times when he was speaking to them through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would let people know what they needed to know for an instance. We found references to God speaking through Scripture. We even found that there were two men in white that showed up, dressed in white, and spoke. And, and by the way, I, uh, a family came and shared with me that after we had that particular sermon, that they went out to the grocery store, and they found two people in white. Um, they happened to be nuns, and I, I don't know what else transpired there, but... Um, so today, we're going to be looking at the story of Saul. And Saul, by the way, is, uh, he'll have a name change eventually, and he'll be known as the Apostle Paul. So this is a, a story about the Apostle Paul uh, when he was known as Saul. 
And what we will see for him is indeed a divine intervention. If you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and take a look at our passage for today. It's from Acts chapter 9. It'll be uh, the first 19 verses. And if you're participating in worship at home, we encourage you, go ahead and have your Bible open and that you might be able to make notes in it. We'll also put it on the screen. Let us hear the Word of God. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from uh, many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. May God bless the reading of his word. And may God shine his favor on us as we come under his word today. Here's our plan. Here's our plan. We're going to look at the story in three parts. We're going to look at the part that has Saul uh, leading up to and then encountering Jesus. And then we'll have a, a, a look at Saul's salvific event, his event of salvation. And then we'll take a look at Paul or Saul following the encounter. What we're going to discover, I believe, is that true salvation is Christ-centered, is Christ-achieved, and is Christ-directed. So let's begin. True salvation is Christ-centered. What do we know about Saul prior to his encounter with Christ? Turns out we know quite a bit. There's some information from outside the Bible and then information from inside the Bible. There's a, a piece that was written. We're going to look at some information about Paul's physical being. And we're going to look at information about his, just generally about him. And then we'll look at some information about his religious or, or the spiritual journey he had been on. So first of the physical. This is an extra biblical piece. And this was written, or at least the first reference we have to it is in the late second century there's some discussion as it being based on oral tradition, and we'll take this with a bit of grain of salt, but I just love the description so much, I, I, I didn't want to keep it back from all of us. So here's a physical description of, of Saul, um, uh, eventually Paul. Here's how he's described. A man 
little of stature, thin-haired upon the head, crooked in the legs, of good state of body, with eyebrows joining, and nose somewhat crooked. It's sounding so good, is it? Awesome. Some of us are going, yeah, my kind of guy. And then it goes on to say, full of grace, for sometimes he appeared like a man, and sometimes he had the face of an angel. What a great, don't you just think in his yearbook, that would have been his description underneath? Generally, though, we're told he's a, a man of Tarsus. There's a spot in Scripture where it talks about Saul being from Tarsus. There's some grammatical things going on in the sentence, and it, it can either lead us to understand that he's from uh, Tarsus but grew up in Jerusalem, or it could mean that he grew up in Tarsus and then later came to Jerusalem. Um, one thing we do know about Tarsus is that it was a, a, a community on a prominent east road, uh, east-west road, and, and it was really a center of philosophy and education. That's kind of his background, so that Tarsus. We know that his, uh, his, he also has a background in tent making, and uh, more than likely that's his family's uh, experience as well, and he's grown up in, uh, with some level of income and, and and wealth to his family. They had a number of uh, uh, connections uh, that the family had uh, in the community. We know that he was a Roman citizen, that he was a student, and this transitions us into some spiritual or religious background. He was a student of Gamaliel, a prominent uh, teacher in Jerusalem. When it comes to his religious background, we find that uh, Paul, uh, Saul, eventually uh, he describes it uh, for us himself. That in his letter to the Philippians, here's what he says about himself. He says, listen, I'm circum circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. All those phrases together indicate, I know my lineage. I, I, know, where, I know from whence I have come. And, and if you look at us, we know we know our bloodline. He goes on to say that uh, as to the law, he is a Pharisee. The Pharisees were the strictest sect when it came to following the law of God. Uh, they laid um, the burden on themselves and those around them that they were going to be committed to having the law, the Torah, the, the teachings at the center of their life. He goes, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. We don't have a, a lot of time to be able to go and explore all of zealotry, but just to know that his passion was so much, so deep was his zeal, that he would even go to the point of making use of, of violence, of, of taking the lead and going and capturing those and stopping those who were proposing a different way. And he says, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. And for Saul, this wouldn't be some kind of extra part of life. Like, hey, if you want to know my religious self, religious self would have been his entire self, that, that it would impact all of who he was. Maybe another way to express it would be that Saul was a Jewish person's Jewish person. For the Jewish people that Saul would have seen himself as one who was, he even says it, that he was advancing. He was living out the Jewish life. This is who we experience when we come to our text. This is where we pick up the story. And so when we look at verses 1 and 2, here's what we find. But Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, followers of Christ, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Saul living out what he knew to be his identity, his calling, his passion. Then we find that the encounter happens. Verse 3, now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. Saul, as a Pharisee, as a student of God's word, would have known of Theophanies, 
in the old, what we call the Old Testament. He would have known those stories and would have known them by heart. And here, in the midst of his journey to Damascus, as he's approaching the town, he himself has something that, that he's unsure of what's taking place, that, that there's this encounter with this bright light, and he falls to the ground. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, as readers of the story, as people who come into the story, we're finding that we know that, that Saul was going after Christians, after, after people of the way. And Jesus' word to him, his question to him is, is not, why are you persecuting children of the way? He says, why are you persecuting me? And Saul's only words in the whole of this story come next. Verse 5, and he said, who are you, Lord? In the whole of the story, Saul's only words are these words just of a question, who are you, Lord? If you've been a student of the Bible, it's, you may already know that, that the word for Lord can be a, a common word that you use as who are you, sir? Who are you, sir? Or it can be in terms of the Lord, the, the Lord God, that, that you would use the same word for Lord. And here, because of the context and what we see in taking place in the story and the falling down and, and, and the, the light shining, that, that there's something probably more of an acknowledgement, that there's something more going on, that there's, Paul wouldn't have had the term for it, but a, a Christophany, that this is Jesus showing up the Christ and, and, and Saul is having an experience of the living Christ. Who are you, Lord? And Jesus said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. So what can we make of this story so far? Paul believed. Paul believed full well that he was, ex uh, he was serving God extremely well. Paul's or Saul's self-description was that he was serving God extremely well in his understanding on that road to Damascus that he was doing the right thing with the law at the center, with his religious journey at the center of all things, with his passion to live out that calling, that, that sense of, of that law and, and being a Pharisee and keeping a zeal for, for the purity of God's people. In fact, to persecute the followers of a false Messiah would be one of the best things for Saul in Saul's mind that a Jewish person could do. But it turned out that he was actually persecuting the true Messiah. Here's where we get that true salvation is Christ-centered. Saul thought that he was truly living out the life. That something else was at the center of his religious experience, his zealotry. And Jesus shows up and says, listen, when you persecute them, you're persecuting me. And there's this encounter with a living Christ. And he's to be the one who's the center of all things. Maybe you've experienced this in your own life in church. You know, churches are to be a places of change. God is always at work transforming us into the image of Christ. And so there's always this process of change taking place, of transformation of God doing things and God calling his people into a deeper level of faithfulness, a truer, a more aligned level of faithfulness, to, to get our targeting software focused on the right things so it's aimed that we can be locked in, locked in, not on destructive things, but on life-giving things. Maybe in your experience of change in the church, you've come across people, maybe even ourselves, we have been, righteous defenders of something different. 
Oftentimes it's called righteous defenders of tradition. Well, that's not the way we've done it before. And we hide sometimes behind even that word of tradition where we reuse that word tradition to talk about the things we're comfortable with, the things we like, the things we have uh, become used to and we would prefer to keep for ourselves. And if anyone brings up the possibility of change, of, of directing and, and allowing God through Scripture, through His Spirit to, to zone our targeting system in, that we can be locked in on the very things of Christ, we push back. Why is this so important for us right now? Well, as a congregation, we're asking, what's next, Lord? What do you have next for us? What what word do you have? What what do you want to tell us? What what do you want to affirm in us? And what do you want to convict in us? And we want to be open for that. In other words, we're asking, we're we're sharing with Jesus, we want to be locked in on you. And if there's something in our midst that's not locked in on you, would you make that clear to us? Would you speak to us that we would be Christ-centered? This idea of being Christ-centered, there's competition to other things in what's at the center of who we are. There's ways of determining what's at the center of who we are. You know, sometimes when we turn up the pressure in life, when we feel like life has turned up the pressure, we can see what's at the center of us. Maybe picture yourself in a conversation Uh, that you've had with someone you you like or love or maybe a spouse or a a sibling or a a parent or a friend or whatever it is. And what drives those conversations? What's at the center of those conversations with you? Are are we in a position of defending ourselves and and protecting what's comfortable to us and, and pushing things away? Are we open at that moment to be driven by Jesus Christ? Is he at the center of those conversations? We can look at things that aren't high pressure. Maybe we look at things where the pressure is really, really low. Maybe it can be even a time like we have a day off or we have a vacation or whatever. We can ask, what's driving those times? What sets the agenda? What what leads us into the choices? Is it personal preference? Is it all about me? Or is Christ at the center speaking into every moment of our lives? As a congregation, we want to be ready to hear whatever Christ would reveal to us through Scripture, through His Spirit, that we would be ready to let go. True salvation, true salvation is Christ-centered. Turns out true salvation is also Christ-achieved. In our story, Paul falls to the ground. He becomes blind. He can't see. We're told that the people with him, and maybe he was traveling with others that he were also just happened to be traveling. Uh, people of his time would do that. They, you wouldn't usually just go for a journey by yourself. You would gather in groups and go on the road together. Probably, though, he actually had some folks with him that were part of his team going to Damascus with these papers. And they hear a voice, but they don't see what he sees. And their presence helps us that this is not just some mystical event that Saul had on the road, some kind of private uh, awakening. But this is a happening, a, a very real happening taking place. They didn't understand it. They weren't let in on what was transpiring. But they were there as an affirmation, confirmation that something took place. And what took place changes the journey for Saul. He enters Damascus dependent, humbled. He was going there to arrest others. Instead, he goes there arrested by Jesus, reliant on others to lead him. You know, Paul would later talk about this moment, whether it was in that moment on the road during those three days, whatever it was that that God captured his heart and, and took him from being lost to being found, from being blind to one who could see. He would talk about it later. We have it in passages like Galatians 2.20. Paul would write later, he'd go, listen, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you hear his description? 
It's not, hey, listen, you want to know something great about me? I'm like the greatest Christian. He goes, here's how it happened. Jesus accomplished it. When he died on the cross, I, that's, my, that's my death, his death. He died for me. I have been crucified with Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Paul writes it this way, that God caused him to be sin, caused Jesus to be sin, caused him to be sin, the one who knew no sin. In other words, Jesus who had no sin became sin. He took on all of our sin that we might become the righteousness of Christ. Paul's description of salvation. Jesus achieves it. God working in Jesus. Romans 1.16, he, he writes to the Romans. This is how he describes it. Listen, I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. I'm not ashamed of the good news of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Jesus achieves this. True salvation is Christ achieved. There's a, a, a longer passage. I just wanted to, uh, to work in this. So it goes like this. Ephesians 1, 3 through 7. Just listen to this description as Paul describes what he encountered, what all of us encountered in Jesus. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Compare that to Paul's other list which was so self-focused and now he puts it all on the Father, blessing him in Christ. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of of his grace. True salvation is Christ achieved. Salvation relies on an, 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 on an encounter with Jesus and his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. So what's your testimony? Do you know this testimony that we hear, see here and read here of Paul, Luke includes it two other times in the book of Acts, which in this small amount of words to know that the focus is this is an important story. And what's your story? What's your testimony of Christ being at the center and achieving your salvation for you? Maybe you've had a specific memory you can go back to. I, I happen to have that experience. I, I was a sixth grader, and, and I, I'm sure I've, I know I've told this story in different contexts here, but maybe it's been a while from up front. I know that on a Sunday morning in a little Presbyterian church in San Jose, California, there was a middle school student who died of an aneurysm in the parking lot that morning. The pastor was speaking and preaching on Hebrews chapter 12, where it talks about how God disciplines his children because he loves them. And somehow, when at the end of the service where the associate pastor gets up, shares the news of this young boy's death, and somehow God used that in my mind to, to shift it. That the person we were talking about, the, the God we were talking about, wasn't just some story. That this God exists and is real. And in the context of a youth group, I got to know who Jesus was. That Jesus achieved my salvation for me. What's your story? Maybe yours is a longer experience. Maybe yours isn't a day you can look back to or a moment. Maybe you say, I've always known Jesus. I've grown up in the church. But is that Jesus at the center, that testimony that Jesus achieved your salvation for you? Which leads us to be able to ask the question, am I living the life I've achieved for myself? Or am I living the life that Jesus achieved for me on the cross. And so finally, the true salvation is Christ-directed. Christ true salvation is Christ-directed. Turns out that salvation is not just a future event. Sometimes we can think that. Sometimes there can be this popular understanding, you know, I, yeah, I'm saved, but that has more to do with when I die. And when I die, I get to go to heaven. That's really salvation, just when I die when I, and I get to go to heaven. But if we've been following the words along this way, 
In fact, even in the text that uh, Michael shared with us at the beginning of the service, in Ephes- uh, his was in Philippians, um, uh, and we know that Jesus gave his life for us. In another place, in Ephesians, in chapter 2, verse 8, that uh, we read the words, by grace you have been saved. Do you get that? You have been. It's occurred. It has continuation in your life, but it's occurred in the past, and it's moving forward even to today. Or even when in that passage that we recall, Galatians 2.20, the life I now live in the flesh. Paul lives his salvation in the flesh. And so when we get to verse 6 in our passage, it says, Jesus says, but rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. You're going to live out your salvation and I'm going to direct you in your salvation. It's not just a past experience, not just a future experience. It's what we live today. And so when we have the story of Ananias and we see that he had a vision of Jesus, I love this in this book, that, that, that Paul has this encounter with Jesus on the road, Jesus coming and speaking directly to him. For Ananias, it was a vision. And the Lord speaks to him through a vision. And he tells him, go and do this and go speak to uh, Saul and and, and Ananias, in kind of the typical way we respond to God's callings is, really, you know, do you not know? Let me fill you in on some things I'm aware of. You might not be aware of Jesus, uh, as if that's true. And just goes, wait, just go, just go. I've arranged the whole thing. He's expecting you, just go. And Ananias goes, and he lays hands on, and scales fall, and he receives the Holy Spirit, and It's all directed by Christ. And so we know even from the Gospel of John that Jesus leaves us the Holy Spirit to guide us and remind us and direct us, not on something new, but on everything Jesus had already taught. And we know that we're given Scripture as well and that God will always guide according to what He's already revealed. And Scripture reveals Christ to us. And what we learn is that we're all part of God's mission. You know, if you're in a pool, what do you do in a pool? You splash, you float, you swim. What do you do if you're in a stadium? If you're in a stadium, you cheer, you eat hot dogs, you root on your team. What do you do if you're a Christian? If you happen to be in God's mission, then you know you're saved by Christ and you're centered on Christ and you let yourself be directed by Christ. What way are you following? What path are you taking? In our listening as a church right now, in our uh, journey, let us welcome an intervention. Let us welcome. God, would you come in and make sure that our targeting software, our alignment is, is up to date and locked in on Jesus Christ? that we might be his hands and feet in this world. Will you have a vision in which Christ speaks to you? I don't know, maybe. Here's what I can guarantee, that whatever we hear will be Christ-centered. Whatever we hear will be connected to what Christ has achieved for us in our salvation. And whatever we hear will be directed by Christ as we move forward. As is our salvation. Christ-centered, Christ-achieved, Christ directed, so is our ministry to be Christ centered, Christ achieved, Christ directed. When we come to this meal, when we come to this meal, it is a, a, a celebration of the, of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's an acknowledgement that Jesus indeed is the Son of God who died on the cross for us, who achieved our salvation, and who now lives and directs us in the covenant relationship we have with him. And Jesus gave the picture. On the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat of it, do so remembering me. In the same way he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the, of the new covenant sealed in my blood. I'm at the center of it. I'm the one who achieves it for you. I'll direct you as you go forward. The cup of the new covenant sealed in his blood 
That whenever we would drink of it, we would proclaim his life, his death, and our new life in him. This meal is intended for you, that you don't have to be a member of this church or any church. We would ask that you've said yes to Jesus, that you've realized and experienced that being a follower of Christ, a a child of the way. If you're not there yet, I'm so glad you're in the room, but hold off on the meal until that time when you know that that Jesus is your Lord. If those who are serving, if you come forward, uh, Jim and Pam, if you'd come forward, and the rest of us, as, as we would make our way to the center aisle and make our way forward, and that we would simply put our hands out as we come forward and Pam and Jim will take one of the communion elements and put it in our hands and as we're singing this song as you are led would you feel free to share to enjoy that meal would you enjoy that meal as your heart is prepared and at the end we'll pray together come for the meal is ready let us share together I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. Satisfied here in your love. And oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. seen them all, you still call me friend, cause the God of the mountains is the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace will find me again, oh, oh there's nothing enjoy the meal together. Let's pray. Father, as Paul would go on to write, being led by your Spirit, 
that even before the foundations of the world, you had all of this in mind. That through your power working in Jesus Christ, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, at work for our salvation, Jesus dying on the cross for us, that he is the center of all things. May he be the center of our life. That he's the one who achieved our place before you, that what is righteous about him has been accounted to us. And that you would go on directing us in the way of Christ, that we would live for him until the day he returns and makes a new heaven and a new earth. We're so thankful for all these things. And we give ourselves to you. In Christ's name, we pray all of this. Amen. Thank you for being in worship today. Uh, There may be that there are some questions that you have you want to follow up on, please do. We welcome those. If you brought a financial gift as part of your worship this morning, we have the blue buckets. That's also the place where you put those connect cards. That would be so helpful. Let's go. Let's go into this world full of the love of Christ and let us share that love with those we meet in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you.